<laughs> my, uh, as you all know, my name's Sarah and I, I work for the Royal Shakespeare Company. And my job um, is the Director of Digital Development and it's the first role at the company called that. And its, it's job was always to um, bring together arts and technology. So extend the theatre making toolkit. And up till um, March this year, we, we were working on a huge project um, based on the Tempest, building on the Tempest. And for those who don't know what the Tempest was, um, Back in 2016, um, it was the 400th anniversary of Shakespeare's death, and we wanted to look at his, Shakespeare's last play, which is The Tempest, and arguably his most magical and innovative play. And in that production, what we managed to do um, was bring in technology that we'd never used in our theatre making practice before. And how we achieved that was through collaboration and reaching out to a company called Intel, and working with them on how we could create 21st century puppetry using what we know as real time motion capture, using technology from games engines, from film, from, from film and broadcast and bring them in to theater. And, and that was a, a huge success. We, we looked at the character of Ariel in the play, the character, we don't know whether Ariel is a he or she, and the character also transforms into different states when uh, he or she is angry or being mischievous. So it was perfect to explore a real-time digital avatar that was powered by Mark Courtley, um, who is the most amazing, wonderful, generous actor there is. And the reason why I say that is because he actually um, perform agreed to do the show thinking that he would never be seen on stage. And actually that wasn't the case. He ended up, because the technology moved so quickly, he ended up being seen on stage. So that was delightful. And it was a real reminder about the generosity of spirit and innovation that we have in, um, in, our, in our world. And that's really important to say. Um, so that was The Tempest back in 2016. And we moved through that. And we had really many different people come see the show. And again, what it was able to do was to be a bit of a convener of people going, oh, the RSC are doing something different. That's super exciting, let's come and see. And then let's have a conversation. And in the UK, it's been a huge investor in innovation uh, through research and development. And there was a call out a few years ago called Audience of the Future. An audience of the future was um, a basically a um, an invitation to put applications together that would explore the future of live performance using immersive technology. And instead of just the Royal Shakespeare Company working on its on, on its own, what I really felt strongly about was. Um, how we could do that not only ourselves but with a wide range of people um, and really impact on the sector really um, sort of show the variety of possibilities that we could use immersive technology in live performance so not just look at theatre but look at music so we invited the Philharmonia Orchestra to collaborate with us um, immersive theatre punch drunk we invited punch drunk and and the brilliant work that they do and have done for a very long time around immersive work and what that would mean with new tech. Um, and Manchester International Festival, so the festival model, the variety of um, music, uh, live, live events and scale at international levels. And then um, the digital studio Marshmallow Laser Feast. And from there we created what I call as a Star Wars bar of um, uh, people effectively um, uh, coming together with all their different um, appetites and all their different ways that they could look at live performance. And we embarked on um, uh, a set of R&D challenges between us where we played to our strengths, we looked what we were interested in and we invited technology companies to collaborate with us and those technology companies um, were Epic Games, who we'd worked with with the Unreal Engine and on the Tempest. 
and we're really inputting and supporting creators and still are their mega grants program is is continuing not just to look at game game development but non-game work in game engine uh, magic leap and um, in we continued our relationship with intel and alongside that we for the first time brought together university partners so often with practitioners what's happening is um, we do our thing and then we move on to the next thing we move on to the next project and very rarely do we get the opportunity to reflect understand see what we're doing and um, understand it from a data perspective, understand it from an audience perspective, but also document what we're doing so we can share that learning more broadly. And this was a huge success. We were doing really, really well. Um, we announced that we were going to do a real time motion captured performance of a Midsummer Night's Dream in a disused shopping center in Stratford-upon-Avon in June and then March hit and we had to cancel everything. But you said like you had to cancel and so what was the switch at the moment when you knew that, okay, this is the moment that we need to end up the rehearsal, we are locked down. I remember that in uh, uh, Great Britain, it was quite hectic as the limitation of and freedom of movement, uh, uh, meeting up to six people, etc. So uh, what was the first feelings and how have you reframed the model of work? So what we effectively had to do, we were in a very heavy production phase. And in that moment, we, I just had to call everyone and we had to stop. And it was quite profound. And we had to gather together very quickly. Uh, we, had the, we had the lockdown moment and we had to stop everything on production. And the first thing, and we had 14 partners. It's a huge, huge partnership. And a huge amount of investment and rehearsal and and planning and preparation we were starting to bring the set into into the shopping center um we all had to stop and and there were moments where these are small studios these are studios and freelancers that are running on very very tight timelines and we just had to stop and help each other um so the first thing i did was make sure everyone got paid properly make sure everyone was okay that was the first bit um, it's when you're working in an institution, the different, you know, what we realize in collaboration is one of the strengths of it is you can help each other because you've created a network. And then what I did was a commissioned a consultation piece across the entire consortium and then audience research. I was like, where are our audiences right now? How do we find out where they are? And then start a pivot exercise to go, if we can't be together in person, how do we be together remotely? And from that moment in March till now, we have re-architected Dream to be able to connect together remotely. And to ask our audiences first was quite an important beat because through that research, what we realized and what we found was we didn't, we didn't have the digital equity that we thought audiences do not have access to the technologies that we assume. And when we work with immersive technology, very few people have a VR headset. Um, and also there very few people, not everybody has access to really good broadband or internet connection. And then what you realize is if everyone's at home, they're sharing the devices, they're sharing the technology. And that was a really important beat together for us to go, we mustn't assume that there is a digital privilege out there. And that was a really important beat. But then what we also asked was, what do you want? And overwhelmingly from that research, what came back was togetherness and liveness. And it was a real affirming moment where we went, there is a profound need for live performance. There is an absolute need for us to be together. So how do we can re reconfigure that? And that prompted what you see behind me right now, which is my virtual background. And by not being open to the public, unprecedentedly so, we were able to get into our building and we have scanned the entire Royal Shakespeare Theatre and campus with a LIDAR scan, which is millimetre accurate in a 3D virtual stage now. Um, and that we did that over a week and over time and we've rendered it into the Unreal Games engine. 
and so I'm able to sit here and imagine imagine um being in the theater and most of the time when I come on zooms and I'm I have this in my background people are like oh I miss it oh and, absolutely and went, so one person completely went, effective my, yeah that's my seat and so <laughs> it's it's really interesting to see that so what we've but can you what choose one of the armchairs behind you? <laughs> That's our next step. That's our next <laughs> step. But, but one of the things that um, I've, I've recognised is um, we stopped production and we weren't able to continue because we didn't have the infrastructure to work remotely. But with virtual production tools, we're not just looking at the output of what you see. We're looking at the technology pipeline. We're looking at how you make theatre. And in some areas like lighting and sound, we're really ahead of the game. There is massive, massive technological advancement. But there's some parts of the theatre making process that are still very analogue and still require pen and paper and, and such like. And you don't want to stop those human elements whatsoever. But what you want to do is equip artists, makers, practitioners to be able to do their work remotely now in the mo with the mo the best tools possible. So what we're but committed do, to do. Hmm? Yes. I have just one question. I work as well for the repertory theater, and uh, it's like super interesting to me. Like at the moment of cancellation, did you already set up like the new date? For the development or you gave yourself the time to yeah, let's say yeah. uh, think differently about the midsummer night dream as, as you think about the produce so we gave ourselves the time um there was a Amazing. lot of healing there was a lot of healing to do with um not being able to do a show and we had to grieve that show and we had to give that moment there and we also had to gather the information of what what where our audiences were but where also the consortium was because um we we are making this show and one thing i'm really proud of is that we've kept the consortium together we've kept the community together at this really difficult time and one of the real wonderful moments with the research organizations university of portsmouth it media nesta um de montford university because they weren't impacted quite immediately from the lockdown um, they held us and they 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 got the research and they they provided us with a lot of data and evidence for us to to really help our decision making on our next steps. Um, so we will be making dream again. And that's a wonderful yeah. thing. And I can't sadly show you images because it's all secretly being beavered away and, and all of that. But I, I might try and show you a couple of images to give you a sense of what we're we're looking at. Um, shortly if that's all right and and completely spoiler alert um um but what what um what we have done is acknowledge that what's really come up is the inequity that there is in our world right now and to make a show that is coming out of the darkness that is hopeful that is joyful but also recognize looking at the play the dream Midsummer Night's Dream as a play is all about the world in flux and I can't imagine a better play right now to talk about the world in flux than that but we're going to just take you on the, the spirit world um, and not the human world of the play um, and the collaboration continues with Marshmallow Laser Feast, um, Manchester International Festival, Philharmonia Orchestra and ourselves and we spent a long time re-architecting how do we do this in a COVID safe way? What happens if we lock down again? Um, how can we achieve this by working remotely? Um, so we, we're using virtual, virtual production tools to achieve that and prototyping it, but we're also making theatre in as least in a person way as possible, but finding out how we can create that humanness. So um, we're really, we've really come together on that and so we'll perform the play um, and distribute it through our own platform um, mm -hmm. made by artists for audiences um, and it will be available on desktop and mobile and there will be levels of them 
Uh -huh. So not only the super advanced like XR tools, but as well you're dedicating it to, let's say, uh, usual uh, mobile tools uh, as we do now communicating with each other. So it's not dedicated only to the super advanced audiences. That's right. And I think that's really important to say our biggest learning through this whole experience, and I'm going to try and share my screen in a minute, which I get very nervous about, is... Um, Don't worry. Uh, we want, there was a very big debate for us. And it, I think, I think in a way without the pandemic, maybe we wouldn't have discussed this so much, but when you're looking at the most high tech immersive technologies, they're not all accessible to people. Um, pre COVID when you could put on an installation, you could use those technologies and people wouldn't need to own them but they could experience them by coming into a building and experiencing them. So the ticket purchase was the, or the access to the building was the accessibility point. But that's Absolutely. changed fundamentally. That if we're going in, if we're looking at home as a destination for live performance now, which we are, we have to work with the tools and the technologies that people have in their hands. But alongside so that- made, uh, So how did you make them accessible? How did you reframe it? So we've reframed it where we will have um, an experience that will be passive, that audiences can enjoy like we're experiencing now and have that sense of wonderment. And then we will have an experience that will be more immersed. And I so want to talk to you about some of it, but it's all secret, secret. But um, some of that technology you will be able to interact with and you will be able to interact with the performance and you will be able to have a connection with the performance. So one thing that we've been um, investigating as well is um, when we're in this theater behind me, when an actor performs, an audience has a connection with that actor and performer, um, that actor knows how that audience feels. Um, and that's really important to the actor's performance. And that's why it changes every night it has a different audience every night and it changes in that way and we we wanted to play and look at that as a construct so what we want to do is create a feed, a real time feedback loop so we will present the show online accessible on desktop mobile and tablet but you will be asked to do something where we know how you feel and that performer in real time will know how you feel and so when the audience research came back to us about connectedness and liveness and that's what audiences are craving that's what we responded to and if i can screen share i'd like to just sure. show you a setup I'm hiding how, myself um a setup of how we will make that look um in 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 the before the performer so bear with me one second i get very stressed about sharing my screen Ooh, so here we go. This is what the stage will look like. And um, this will be at the University of Portsmouth, which is the um, Creative XR uh, studio, which we're safely setting up. And this will be the performer, what the performer will feel. And in that there will be um, signifiers for that performer to know how the real world the connected world will be sharing their, their world with you. And that's super exciting. And that's set up using real time tech. And, and that's, if you look at it in technology terms, what you're also seeing is this. So the spatial understanding is that the virtual world will be 3D and whatever you do on your desktop um, or your mobile final tablet you'll be able to see. So I will stop sharing for a second. But let's pause on that a moment because um, just to talk you through the safety angle of it, which we're all obsessed by at the moment, that cast, the actors will be completely bubbled with a really, really small crew and will have nothing apart from the online world connecting with them. And that's quite profound. I won't be allowed in the room. No one's going to be allowed in the room. And we will share that um, content in real time uh, for you there. And, and it That's is a bit of 
just to be clear, you no longer imagine this Midsummer Night's Dream as the one that you will meet with the audience in the venue that you are no. picturing. Okay. No, no that's Complete gone. Digital transformation. That's gone. That play we we can't do, and that we that's what I say. We had to grieve that play, and we had to we had to um, uh, yeah we had to share that play, and we had to we had to let that play go. And through the, the pandemic, um, we have had to absolutely change every single process. We've actually had to come together. We've had to look at new skills. And one of the things that we, we haven't had to do before is look at distribution because we took for granted our distribution mo models and we took for granted that we could access audiences. And I think that um, that's a profound shift. But what we're trying to change is traditional broadcast models where we'll stream a video and you passively watch that. We have to think about live performance and what that means. And to do that, the performer fundamentally needs to know how the audience feel. Um, and and feel so them. that's, and then, and it feels them. And so we'll be asking our audiences to participate in the, in the performance and be part of the play um, in real time. And, and we, will, we will run it like a show. This I, is something which is scaring for like great part of the audiences. Like I know even the writers who are saying that the most biggest fear about going to the theater is that they will be just invited on stage and being invited to take part in the performance. So uh, in the digital world, it might feel safer, but still this is something which uh, really encourage to try something new. Yeah, I, well, that's why we have the passive experience. So we'll have an experience where you don't need to stand on stage at all. Sure. So we'll celebrate the people that do want to experience it, and they won't. And it won't be um, an experience which makes you exposed. You, you. It will be an experience where you will see something that you're part of. Yours. Okay. So I think our profound learning is um, we will do Midsummer Night Stream next year. And we will also change the audience times to fit around the world. We're now globally programming. So we'll do performances that times that fit the US, Europe and Asia. We'll also be looking about connection with accessibility. So incorporating how really asking ourselves big questions around what are the barriers to these experiences and how do we welcome people? And one of the most important things is the new rituals in theatre and looking at home as a destination for performance and how do we be in your homes with you um, and how do you feel connected to us it's not just about technology it's actually about human connection and how do we not take for granted the rituals that we have when we enter a physical building a space when we know when the lights go out that we're going to experience a piece of theatre how do we give you that sense of event when at home you have the distraction of your social media of the emails coming through of of what's for dinner um how you're gonna you know extend this um you know the doorbell going with an amazon delivery how do we how do we with that huge amount of interruption how do we create the ritual that you are part of this experience together um so can really you say how um yeah we will be um we'll welcome you to our stage we will we will bring you in we will think about that front of house moment we will think about you knowing that our other people are there we will think we are exploring ways that we can let you connect with audience members one of the interesting things is when we're in these spaces we may not always speak to each other but we're connecting and um we're we're together and Sometimes people have said to me, this theatre isn't immersive. And, and I, I, I think it is. I think this, we're sat together. We may not be talking to each other. We may be looking in a certain direction, but we are together and we are immersed. And I've always said that the theatre is the, one of the best virtual reality headsets you can possibly purchase. Um, and I think it's on, in those principles that we're taking it to to people's people's homes and so again you go back to technology as a piece of paper and if we sent you something that you could open at the same time knowing that you were opening that envelope at the same time as everyone else in real time 
those are the beats those are the those are the beats and those are the pieces of magic that we can do so when i talk about real time technology i'm talking about the most cutting edge bleeding edge some technology that we'll use in dream next year but i'm also talking about some of the most brilliant technology which is a piece of paper a human connection and and converging that together as a as an experiment next year we will experiment we will take risk we will be bold uh, we will learn from it and then we hope to share all those learnings next year with the sector so we'll have a huge sharing of all our technology pipelines the technical specs how we made it because what we want is all of us to share and learn this because there's nothing proprietorial now about our exploration. Can I just bomb in and ask sure. one question that I really wanted to ask? I couldn't really not use this opportunity to, to ask Sarah something uh, that I think might be important for, for the people who listen to us. Uh, I've been a, a, a huge fan of Sarah's work uh, at the RSC, but also of the entire audience of the future program, which is really something I encourage everyone to learn a little bit more about. But I wanted just to, to ask you, Sarah, uh, about one thing. So there is, as you said, technology, uh, groundbreaking solutions, huge teams of people who are doing R&D, and then amazing creators, developers, and artists collaborating together. But as you mentioned, at the very basics of this whole huge endeavor, uh, there's a certain vision of a community and when we have been preparing for this conference I remember a moment when we uh, when we were speaking about this um, professional creative family uh, so I just wanted to ask you a little bit about the driving power before everything you do as an innovator in this very special uh, industry uh, about the values and, and goals that actually keep you going and um, if you could share a little bit of that with us because this is such an inspiration, I guess. Yeah, there is, um, there's a brilliant quote by Norbert Weiner, who said, to be successful in this new world, either the engineers must become poets or the poets must become engineers. And I genuinely believe that that's always been the case in theater. I think there's always been engineers and poets. Um, but what drives me is, um, I, I, I do think if you put this technology, this, we're in a, a moment now where we've been very technology first. Um, we're, we've, a profound shift has happened in our generation of the internet. Um, and, you know, I, I look back at my grandma who remembers the first time she heard a telephone ring and it scared her so much, but she remembers it in these profound shifts um, but I do believe we're at a really delicate moment where we've been technology first, but what artists do is make us question and they make us see something through a different lens in a different way. And if we don't welcome people from different industries and different backgrounds, if we don't think about the welcome that we have in our sectors, we become very quickly polarised and disenfranchised and disconnected. And the digital inequities are about people's silence as well not being having a voice so what drives me is um to do the unexpected in traditional way in traditional formats and to create change and different ways of working that give permission for risk um but at the same point give pride in what demonstrating pride in what you do um and genuinely um i do think work with artists to enable them to imagine with a whole new tool set um but what fundamentally drives me is is change really and um looking at infrastructures that have existed a long time and question why they're there and what they're about and what they do and and also what drives me is people the thing that got us through this very difficult time was people and a collaboration that was a people network where there was so much goodwill. Um, I think when things are very difficult, you do realise and value those things that you take for granted um, around around um, people wanting to to make something happen or help. Um, and I think we could do it with a lot more of that, actually, which is why putting it out to the sector is so important. 
this togetherness gathering community will be our key uh, topics for the discussions that we will end up like this afternoon. It will be 12 past uh, 20 past 12, so in 40 minutes. But for now, I would love like very, very much say thank you to you, not only for this presentation today, but uh, moreover than that, really to encourage everybody to take the risk as technology is only like one risk further than just taking artistic decision that it's not the easy one each time. So thank you for empowering us in taking this risk and in searching further for new solutions that may uh, somehow shift our arts activities somewhere else.